birds from the World Bird Sanctuary, which is located just outside of St. Louis, Missouri. This is Sheldon, and Sheldon is a Harris's hawk. Harris's hawks are found in the southwestern part of the United States. These are birds that are found from western Texas all the way over to southern California. And because they live in the desert, they've had to make some changes to the way that they live. Because the desert is a lot more difficult place to live than where we do. Uh, most birds of prey are very solitary, which means they spend most of their time by themselves. However, the Harris's hawks have figured out that by working together and hunting with their families, they can catch much larger prey than they would be able to on their own. Sheldon here would easily be able to catch a mouse or a lizard by himself, but his favorite type of food is the jackrabbit. So if you imagine Sheldon flying down over a jackrabbit, he's going to be footing and screaming at it, and he's going to chase it underneath a bush or a shrub. Well, that jackrabbit's going to wait and wait and wait, and he's going to hope that Sheldon finds something more interesting than the rabbit to eat. Well, once that rabbit has to poke his head out on the other side and check and see if Sheldon's still there, you know what the rabbit's going to find? All the rest of Sheldon's family. And they're going to pounce, and then there's going to be food for everybody. Now, this is important because these birds are often called the wolf packs of the sky. But they're different from wolves in an important thing. These birds don't let the adults eat the most and the best food, like in a wolf pack. Instead, it's the young birds that eat the most and best food because all birds of prey, no matter how big or small they are, reach their full size in just two to three months. So imagine if you guys got as big and tall as you were ever going to get in 90 days. You guys would never ever have school clothes that fit. That'd be a problem for your parents. But luckily, parent Harris hawks, they don't have to worry about that. Instead, they know the faster their babies grow, they can reach full size, they can learn how to fly, and then they can learn how to hunt, and that's going to benefit the entire group. Now, the other thing that Harris hawks have to worry about is where out there in the desert to perch. We see our hawks a lot of times sitting up on phone lines or fence posts or very tall trees. But there's not a lot of tall trees to be found in the desert. So instead, these birds have to utilize the tall perches they have, which of course are the cacti. Now I don't know about you guys, but I never really thought it sounded like a great idea to stand on top of a cactus in my bare feet. But that's what these birds do all the time. They know if they stand at the very tip of the arm of the cactus, that's where those needles are soft and still growing, and it won't hurt the feet of the bird. Now the other problem there is though, there's lots of room on the arm of the cactus for Sheldon, but remember he's hunting with the rest of his family, so they need a place to go to. So his brother and sister, they're gonna bow up their feet, they're gonna come over and land doink right on Sheldon's shoulders. So I have two birds standing one on top of the other. Along is going to come maybe mom or dad, maybe another brother or sister. They're going to do the same thing. They're going to land on the shoulders of the second bird. So now you have three birds standing one on top of the other like this giant screaming rabbit killing totem pole. Well, they don't stay that way for very long. They only stay that way long enough to find food. Once they've spotted something, the one on the bottom will wag that long, beautiful tail. They'll all break apart and fly off after whatever it is that they've spotted. So this guy is the American kestrel. His name is Jet. He's the smallest species of falcon found in North America. Now, kestrels are very common, and they eat a wide variety of things. They can eat things like mice and insects, little lizards, little snakes, and even birds about their same size. And that's one way that you can find these birds out in the wild, because one of the best places they like to perch is up on phone lines, right along the side of the road. Now, if they're perched up on that phone line, they do a couple of things that are a little different than other birds that are about their same size. As Jet's going by, you might see him bob his little tail up and down, he might bob his head up and down, and that's one way that you can tell you're looking at a kestrel. The other thing is that the American kestrel is always going to be sitting by himself. Nobody wants to sit next to the kestrel just in case he gets hungry. So that's something else you can look for up on that phone line. Now these birds are cavity nesters. They live in the holes of dead and dying trees, and they will also use nest boxes that we can build for them. And that will bring these great little pest controllers right to our own backyard. 
Kestrels, because they're small, they can do a couple of things that other birds of prey don't do or can't do. One of those is they can hover in the air just like a hummingbird. But the other thing that they do more often is called kiting. This is where the bird will fly into the wind as fast as the wind pushes them backwards, and that allows them to stay in one place in the air while searching for food below them. When they find it, they fold up like a bullet shape and dive straight towards the ground. Now along roadsides and in the grassy medians in between the lanes is also a great place to be able to see these birds doing that. Something else that makes the American kestrel special has to do with his coloring. Now most birds of prey, you can only tell the difference between the boys and the girls by their size. Believe it or not, in birds of prey, it's the girl birds that are always bigger and stronger than the boys. Now some of you guys might think that's a pretty fun fact. I know I do. But, and this is true in the kestrel as well. However, American kestrels also have a difference in color between the boys and girls where most birds of prey do not. So Jet here is a male. You can see he has those beautiful dark blue wings with the black spots on them. His tail is almost completely brown except for the striping around the edges. The female kestrels are going to be a little bit bigger and if you see the brown and black spotting on his back, they're going to look like that pretty much all over including their tail and have just a little bit of blue up there on top of their head. This is Xena, and Xena is a Eurasian eagle owl. This is the largest species of owl found in the world. She looks a lot like the great horned owl that lives around here, and they are in the same family. You can think about them as cousins, but this is a bird that lives in Europe, Asia, and Northern Africa, and they are much larger than great horned owls. They also have big orange eyes instead of the yellow eyes that great horned owls have. This guy over here, he may look like the most adorable baby owl you have ever seen, but you know what? Twig here, he has a full grown adult Eastern Screech Owl, and he is six years older than Xena. Oh Oftentimes people think that these things up here are ears when they're stuck up. They look a lot like ears, but they actually have nothing to do with hearing at all. They simply just tell us a little bit about how the bird is feeling at any given time. The other thing that's important, of course, are those big eyes. Those big eyes let them, to see, um, excuse me, let them see about 100 to anywhere up to 100 times better than we can at night, depending on the species of owl. Some can see even better than others. Now, those eyes take up two-thirds of the space in their head. So there's a couple of problems that go along with that. It's great to be able to see really well at night, especially when that's when you find your food, but there's a couple of problems. Their eyes are so big, there's no room for muscles in there, so they can't move them around like we can. They can only be facing the same direction as their head. So of course, owls can turn their heads around a lot farther than we can, but a lot of people think that they can turn their heads all the way around in a circle. How many of you guys have ever been told that owls can turn their heads all the way around in a circle? Right? Most of us have heard that before. You know what? It's not true. They could turn their heads all the way around in a circle, but only once because their necks would break, just like ours. She can turn her head over one shoulder, behind her back, and over her other shoulder before she has to turn back around. And so she can still see her food coming from any direction. So that's the important part. The other thing is if her eyes take up two thirds of the space inside of her head, well, that only leaves one third of the space up here for something else we have that's kind of important. Brain. Right, the brain. So that whole thing about the wise old owl, not so. There is no such thing as a wise old owl anywhere in nature, only in storybooks. But that's okay because these birds are excellent hunters and they are fantastic parents. And those are the two most important things that they need to be able to do to survive out in the wild. So, all right, we have one more owl to share with you guys. And he is a little bit different than the others that we've already seen. His name is Tobin. And Tobin is one of the birds that was hatched and raised with us at the sanctuary. And he's pretty special for a couple of reasons. Tobin is a European barn owl. Now we have barn owls that live here in our country and live right around this area called American or common barn owls. They all have that beautiful white heart shaped face that's called a facial disc. And that face is shaped like a bowl or a satellite dish and it actually helps them to be able to hear. Now it funnels sound back to their ears. We talked about how their ear openings are just little holes in the side of their head. They also 
have asymmetrical ears, which means that one is higher on their head than the other. So that helps them to triangulate sound, to figure out exactly where the mouse that they're hunting is. So when they fly, they'll fly like this and then turn their head to try to hear exactly where that mouse is. He also has small flaps on his ears, much like the ones that we have. And this allows him to have some of the best hearing of any bird in the entire world. Tobin would be able to hear a mouse running in a forest from up to a quarter of a mile away. Now think about that. If there was a mouse running around in here, you guys probably wouldn't know about it until you saw it or until it ran over your neighbor's shoe and they started screaming about it. <laughs> but Tobin, he would know it was there by hearing alone right away. Now, the other thing that makes the barn owls one of nature's best mouse traps has to do with how they fly. Tobin has fringed feathers all along the leading edges of his wings that are like the teeth of a comb. And those fringes allow the air to go totally silently through his wings and all of those mice never ever know that he's coming. That means that if all of you guys were mice, you'd be in big, big trouble right now. Because even though Tobin is little, out in the wild, he would easily be able to eat almost 2,000 mice in a year by himself. Now these birds are endangered for a couple of reasons in the Midwestern United States. One of the reasons is they don't have a lot of good places to hunt. Barn owls naturally hunt in meadows and open prairies, and we don't have a lot of natural prairie left. They also, as their name sounds like, nest in old barns and abandoned buildings, and we don't have a lot of those around either. The biggest reason though that they're endangered has to do with poisoning. Unfortunately, mouse poison works really, really slowly. And so a mouse that's poisoned may wander around sick and slow for several days before it dies. Now, once Tobin sees that mouse, that one's gonna be easy to catch. So he's gonna go with that one. Well, then the problem is that if that mouse is poisoned, it only takes one poisoned mouse to kill a bird the size of Tobin. So we've lost a lot of barn owls in this area in a pretty short amount of time. All right, we've got one last bird to share with all of you, and he is, of course, the star of our show. You guys might have a guess at what would come in a big carrier that looks like that. It is a bird that is very important to our ecosystem. It is very important to our country. And one of the most important reasons why all of us should help to take care of our waterways and help to conserve water and help to keep them clean. This is also a bird that used to be on the federal endangered species list. What do you guys think it is? You guys are right. This is McGuire, and McGuire is 14 years old this year. Out in the wild, uh, bald eagles can usually live to be about 20 to 25 years old, but in captivity, we've had ones that have lived to be 50. Now, McGuire here came to us actually from a rehabilitation hospital here in Nebraska. Uh, he is what we call an imprinted bird, which basically means he'd lost his fear of people. More than likely, someone found him as a baby, tried to raise him, realized that was a really bad idea, stuck him back out in the wild to fend for himself. Unfortunately, at that point, he thought food came from humans. He didn't know how to hunt by himself, and he was starving, and he was hanging out around people, which is pretty scary. Well, unfortunately, most imprinted birds out in the wild starve because they simply don't know how to hunt for themselves or they aren't motivated to do so. So we're very lucky to have McGuire here because he is an awesome education bird. He's traveled with us all over the country and he's very well behaved. He has very good eagle manners and that's what we like to see in our eagles. Now these birds, as I said, used to be on the federal endangered species list but through a lot of help and education and captive breeding of these birds, they have made it off. In 2007, the bald eagle was taken off of the endangered species list, although they are still endangered in some states. Um, but it is a bird that is doing very, very well. And you can see he's a full-grown adult because of his white head and tail, and he also has yellow eyes and a yellow beak. When they're very young, they're all completely brown. Brown feathers, brown eyes, brown beak, and they start to change from there. So when you guys see these birds flying over, you may see a couple of different colors or shades of the eagles, and you can try to figure out 
how old exactly they are. But this bird is very special, not only because it's our nation's symbol, but also because he's a reason that we should be hopeful. He proves that if we take care of our habitats and we study really hard, we can help to make sure that birds and other wildlife that are endangered get better and that there can be more of them. And so they're a good reason why we should do things like save water and energy and recycle at home and at school so that we can have birds like this around for a very, very long time. Because taking care of our environment, it's not just for adults, it's for all of you guys too. And that's something really important to remember because there's lots of little things you can do that don't take any extra time that make a big difference to these guys. So uh, McGuire, he's a pretty important role model, I think, for the rest of our birds of prey.